one of the many, many things he did was get up very early in the morning and go into Charlottesville and collect trash from the hospital and bring it back here to feed hogs that he was raising. And other trash got deposited, things the hogs would eat, but um, would get deposited in various places around the farm. And there's this big hole and there's a lot of trash lying around it. And I looked around and said, this is, this is a cellar hole. There's a big Osei George tree still growing beside it. There are daffodils that were blooming around it. This is the house site. And then I forgot about it until years later when I started doing more work out there and realized that's the land that Berkeley Bullock owned. About two-thirds of the land that he owned that Scott's going to talk about is actually contained within the Ivy Creek Natural Area. It abutted Hugh Carr's original purchase, um, 1873 purchase, and it's two-thirds of it or so is in the Ivy Creek Natural Area. The rest um, is now part of Roslyn Ridge. So, um, so, another remarkable part of um, the, the history of this place. And without that, or, or with that, I'm going to turn it over finally to Scott Frank. <laughs> I'm going to say needs no introduction because I didn't know he had to do the same Wow. Thank you. There's just so much knowledge in this room. Uh, I'm a little, you know, donkey's but I know so many of you, and so many of you do research on this for different reasons. Some family research, some of you are interested in the history of the community of Hugh Carr and Riverview Farm. And uh, I, I hope that as we go through this, you understand that this is a project, an ongoing research project. And I'm always looking for more information. And if I get anything wrong, please let me know. Um, there's always more opportunities to expand on this. I'm working on an expanded version for Encyclopedia Virginia. So, so I feel like it's never done. Um, so today, uh, I, I'm here from the University of Central Florida, but I spent 23 years in Charlottesville, first getting my PhD in history here, and then teaching and directing uh, research centers, the Carter G. Woodson Institute. I was the associate director under Reginald Butler, um, who I'll show you a nice picture of here. Uh, my great friend and mentor, um, he and I uh, worked very closely together and he's the one who inspired our focus on community research. He and I, it was really coming from him. Uh, he worked with Cinder Stanton, many of you know Cinder, created the uh, Central Virginia Research Group, which has taken various names but still exists to this day and is doing amazing work. But Reginald, when he became director of the Institute, uh, wanted the Institute to play a role in, in facilitating partnerships between academic researchers and lay scholars, because that's the world he came out of. That's, he worked so closely with people like Bob Vernon uh, on his own work uh, in, uh, in Goochland, and he understood the power of that model of collaboration. And so this is a project that came directly out of a center that we co-founded, the Center for the Study of Local Knowledge. Um, and Jean Henderson, uh, is really my other inspiration for this work. She came to the Institute, not knowing me or anyone there, and said, I'm interested in doing some research on my ancestor, Berkeley Bullock. And um, I didn't know anything about Berkeley Bullock at the time, and yet for some reason, and I don't know how these things happen, you just get connected to a story. It must have been her energy, her spirit, that connected me to the story and wanted to know more. And she came with a lot of information. She presented me with her family histories, but there was still a lot more to be gathered. And so that began really almost a, I guess almost 20 years uh, of research on this. Um, and so that's what I'm going to present today, where, where I am with this today. I want to just go back one slide here and just point out a couple things. This is Ivy Creek, uh, a picture I took with my son. He's, he got cropped out of the picture. <laughs> But he was just off to the left there. So we like to hike up here. So I, just, I know this place. I, never, I knew Berkeley Bullock lived out here. I never knew that Ivy Creek encompassed Berkeley Bullock's land until about two weeks ago. And then saw the maps that Steve did, which I'm going to share with you today, and said, you can actually hike a trail through there? It exists already? This is mind-blowing to me. And so what a, an amazing addition to the interpretive uh, opportunities that you that you now have on this site to tell Ber not just Hugh Carr and the Carr family story, but Berkeley Bullock's story as well. The other thing I want to say, and that's Berkeley Bullock in the middle. That that's a picture of him. It's the only known picture we have of him. 
uh, from Corks and Curls, which was the student yearbook and it's at UVA. I'll tell you a bit about that. The last thing I want to mention about this is why am I doing a midlife perspective? It's because Berkeley Bullock lived here in midlife. He came out here and purchased land and had a farm here at midlife. I'm at midlife as well. I like to think I'm still at midlife. <laughs> uh, you know, getting up there. But, um, but I, like the, I thought it's an interesting perspective, midlife, when you have decisions to make. And he had some decisions to make when he was on this land about his future. And so I said, what, a, what an interesting way to kind of think about the view from Union Ridge. What was, what, what was his view at that moment when he had to decide, do I stay here and continue to expand my holdings, or do I move on and, and, and pursue other opportunities? And you'll, you'll get the answer to that. Some of you already know the answer, but uh, I'm going to try to tell that story today. So I just want to pay great tribute to my wonderful mentors and, and, and my inspirations. And we'll move on. So this is a real starting, not the starting point, as you know, the family history was the starting point. But this is an incredibly important source of information about Berkeley Bullock. And it appeared, it's a sketch uh, that appeared in Corks and Curls of the University of Virginia, which was published by the students in 1889-1890. And um, there were five African-American men who were uh, highlighted in this edition of the yearbook. And some of them, uh, as you can see up here, some were long-term employees of the university, and others were just fondly remembered as, quote, odd and picturesque characters. <laughs> so some of them you'll know. Henry Martin, very well known here, the bell ringer, janitor of the Rotunda. Rotunda. Uh, just my Massachusetts just came out. <laughs> 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 That's going to happen. <laughs> This is Dr. Fawcett, and in quotes, uh, and, and a lot more research has been done on these individuals to reveal who they really are in the story behind them. I can't do all of that today, but just to show you, this is in the yearbook. He's the janitor of the dissecting hall. This is John Twine, dispenser of kindling wood and purchase, purchaser of old clothes. His headstone is at Daughters of Science Cemetery, and thank you to my, uh, the hosts of this event, the preservers. Um, John Twine's stone is there. Uh, Uncle Peter, again in quotes, hand handler and storyteller, and then Berkeley Book, a restaurant proprietor. Um, and of course, I can't remember if Gene told me about this sketch or if I found this sketch. It doesn't really matter, but it's an important source, and of course it's a problematic source. It's, it's written in a time, uh, and you'll see. I don't have to explain why it's problematic. All you have to do is sort of read. Uh, their description of Berkeley Bullock. I'm gonna, I am going to read this along with you. Of the many odd and picturesque characters of the Negro race that are to be met with everywhere around the university, but that are now fast passing away before the superior intellectual culture and proud assertion of equal rights on the part of their descendants, Berkeley Bullock is one of the best known and most generally liked by the students. It would take the pen of a Thomas Nelson Page or a Joel Chandler Harris to do justice, justice to the old man, to describe his quaint appearance and quainter ways. And just to sort of contextualize that, Joel Chandler Harris uh, wrote about uh, Uncle Remus. And uh, Thomas Nelson Page was known for his work on social life in old Virginia before the war. The students did not, they, at this point, 1890, they're 20 years old. They were born in 1870. Their understanding of antebellum life comes to them through the writings of Harris and Page. That's their understanding of the characters that they're likening, likening Berkeley Bullock to. He's a medium-sized, weasened little man of perhaps 50, with bandy legs and stooping shoulders. His face is pure, furrowed deep by the plow of time, not a little aided by care, in the shape of a large family and business, much crippled by that our newfangled restaurant over there. He had competition. He was a restaurant owner. He had competition. Berkeley is a silent man and rarely speaks unless spoken to, but when he does, he becomes, does become talkative. It is the talk of the good old antebellum darky, not the polished small talk and chit-chat of the present generation of colored gentlemen. He is full of cornfield philosophy, reminiscences, folklore, and quaint observations on men and things, all so well and pithily expressed that it is well worth one's while to listen with attention to one of our best surviving representatives of the old plantation hand. So this is their caricature, their characterization of the man they know. Um, it's a very, it's a portrait that is uh, obviously uh, condescending, and yet at times 
uh, presented as loving. Um, he's remarkably honest. He's a kind and loving parent, a good friend, an earnest Christian. So there are many qualities that you can read through this and pull from it that they see him as a, as a person to be admired, but the caricature that they're creating does not match up with the figure that you will come to know, that we will come to know through the research on him. Um, but this is another aspect of it, that he knows his place. So what they're contrasting here is the old Negro, the, the caricature, caricature of the old plantation hand, and the new Negro, the, the, the pushing, aspiring class of Negroes of the late 19th century. He well knows his place, he is never pushing, scorning with holy indignation the growing class of half-educated, aspiring Negroes of the present. And I'm not going to read all this, but just so, the point I want to make in quoting this is, they suggest that he says it's not worth wasting education on African Americans, right? That's the quote there. Uh, or that, you know, it, it, it's the schools aren't doing any good on them, what they need is a good, you know, whacking with a barrel stave. But, his life puts the lie to this, right? Um, and that's what we're going to look at today, is how the evidence shows a very different person. Now, what I think is interesting is they call this an imperfect sketch, and it is outrageously imperfect. But, but they would say that, but they feel they know him so well. Um, there's hardly any need to bring him back to memory. Uh, he's so unforgettable, right? And so I think I want to pick up on this idea of the imperfect sketch and try to say, well, there's, a mu there's much more to this man and there's a lot of documentation. Actually, incredibly, so much that we can know about Berkeley Bullock beyond what the students uh, think they know and, and what they tell us. Who is this man behind the perfect sketch? Well, for one thing, he was a literate, self-educated man. Uh, and just to summarize some of the highlights of his life, he freed himself and his mother from slavery. He founded the Ivy Creek. Old, what was called the Old Ivy Creek Church, now the Union Ridge, and this is in the early 20th century, it changed names to Union Ridge. He sent his children to school, and several became teachers and civic leaders, so he did believe in education for his children. He purchased more than a dozen properties in Albemarle County in the city of Charlottesville. He operated a successful restaurant and ice business, and he co-founded, this is really significant. He co-founded the Piedmont Industrial and Land Improvement Company, organized by colored men for the benefit of the African American community. He was one of the founding members of this collaborative. So you'll learn more about this as we go along. But let's start with his uh, birth. He was born in Louisa County, Virginia, sometime around 1830, to enslaved parents, Abraham and Cynthia. This is his lovingly restored headstone, by the way, Mr. King and and so many have made this possible. When I first saw this stone, it was knocked over, turned sideways, and this is how it looks today. This is a beautiful new photo that appears on the UVA Today website. His mother, Cynthia, was said to have been half Indian, the other half some mix of white and black. U.S. Census returns for 1870 and 1880 list him as mulatto, which, of course, is the catch-all phrase for non-white persons of mixed racial ancestry. Is that important? It could be. It could have some uh, value, social value, social capital attached to it for him. But we will we'll at least note that. The Bullock family belonged to Colonel John R. Jones, a wealthy Albemarle County financier and merchant. We actually have a descendant of Colonel Jones in the room today. We have descendants of both Berkeley Bullock and Colonel Jones here today. Um, Jones held a stake in a mercantile firm at Louisa County Courthouse, which explains the Louisa birthplace of Berkeley Hall. He also did quite an extensive business in Albemarle County and acted as the financial agent of several of the most substantial planters and farmers of the county. And we think about what, where Berkeley Bullock might be acquiring some knowledge of real estate and finances. Keep this in mind, that this is some capital that he may have drawn upon, some knowledge he may have drawn upon. We'll see how, how involved he might have been in that. Colonel Jones carried on his mercantile business in the southern half of, of the brick building known as Number Nothing, located in the heart of Charlottesville's Court Square District. That's a historic marker. I don't know if that's still there. Um, it is? Okay, it's still there. And there's the building. This is from the Charlottesville City website. And um, 
There's, there is the market. That's the original. I don't know if this one. I don't think this one is still up. It is. Oh, is it? Oh, oh, it was there Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, this is a building that never received a proper address. That's why it was called mm -hmm. number nothing. And there was a stone block at one time outside the building's southwest corner used for auctioning both goods and slaves until it was abolished. This is from the city's website. Um, but there's also... Um, there are other accounts of the auction block being there. Um, they heard, people had heard that it was used as a slave auction room. That that same building that Jones owned was a slave auction. He, the jo Jones was an auctioneer. Benson and Brothers auctioneer. Um, uh, well, Jones was not an auctioneer, but Benson Brothers. Jones was in the same building with Benson and Brothers auctioneers. And uh, the auction block and the the sign for the auction room was exposed by a southern snow in the 1940s. And a look, this is, as of the 20th century, there was some understanding that this was the site of slave auctions. So more on Colonel Jones. Um, he was a, a, a very significant uh, figure in financial, the financial world of Charlottesville. He was called upon to act as a trustee and administrator in managing the affairs of others. Um, he was the first president of the branch of the Farmers Bank of Virginia. And he owned this fine mansion, which is still standing at 109 East Jefferson Street, where he, he raised a large family of 10 children. And this is known today as Social Hall. It's been known uh, since it, uh, Jones's time as Social Hall. According to the history passed down to us, because they entertained a lot. And so Berkeley Bullock would have been would have known many prominent white Charlottesville <coughs> residents through his association, through his, his enslavement. But that might matter, right? When you get to the later period of his life when he's, his, he's um, engaging in real estate and, and calling upon uh, uh, people to vouch for him or to co-sign on him, <coughs> these kinds of relationships matter. And so Jones, as a figure of importance in his life, that might mean something later. And that's where I'm getting at here, is that he may have gained some social capital um, from his association with Colonel Jones, a white man of high standing and considerable wealth in a society that was ruled by such men. Now, coming back now to family history, according to Bullet Family History, <coughs> young Berkeley performed the duties of a houseboy for the Jones family. So he would have been very intimately involved with Jones and his family. And according to Gene Henderson, he was assigned the head of the commissary when Colonel Jones discovered that he could read and perform other tasks. That's an important role to play. And again, it has something to do with maybe learning some, something about business, right? About um, accounting, about keeping books. That might be of some value, and that gives him some knowledge that he can bring to bear when he is free and able to operate on his own. Now, this, I think this is a really fascinating uh, example of, of the kind of sources we have on Berkeley Bullet. Uh, this is the story of how he learned to read and write, and it tells us a lot about the social world of the slave community and how they, the strategy, strategies of resistance that they employed across households and generations. This is Berkeley Bullock's son, Charles. It's from his memoir, and this is from 1949. He was interviewed by Pearl Graham. Peter Fawcett taught my father, Berkeley Bullock, to read and write by light wood knots in the late hours of night when everyone was supposed to be asleep. They would steal away to a deserted cabin, <coughs> away from the big house, out of sight. Um, and this is this is this story of Peter Fawcett being uh, the person who tr who taught um, Berkeley Bullock is documented in several places. This is from another source from 1900. While with the family of John R. Jones, he, Peter Fawcett, taught all the slaves to read and write, one of whom was Mr. Berkeley Bullock of this city, who for several years was the proprietor of the only restaurant at Union Station in the city. It's remarkable to have this many sources. But we also have, Peter Fawcett talks about this as well. Um, and the backstory on Peter Fawcett is he had once been enslaved to Thomas Jefferson. He was born at Mont Monticello in 1815, taught by Jefferson's grandson, Louis Randolph, to read, and then was sold at auction to Colonel Jones after Jefferson's death. So he talks about this. What, what he, there's much more to his memoir about that transition from 
Monticello to Colonel Jones's house. But the part I'm going to highlight is his description of literacy and the, the threat that posed to Colonel Jones. Um, when I was sold to Colonel Jones, this is Peter Fawcett, I took my books along with me. One day I was kneeling before the fireplace spelling the word Baker when Colonel Jones opened the door, and I shall never forget the scene as long as I live. What have you got there, sir, were his words. I told him. If I ever catch you with a book in your hands, 39 lashes on your bare back. He took the book and threw it into the fire, then called up his sons and told them that if they ever taught me, they would receive the same punishment. But over time, uh, the Joneses came to trust uh, Peter Fawcett, and he adds, notwithstanding that all the time I was teaching all the people around me to read and write, and even venturing to write free passes, and sending slaves away from their masters. <laughs> of course, they didn't know this, or they would not have thought me so valuable. <laughs> So what a connection, right? So Berkeley Bullock was taught to read by Peter Fawcett, um, who lives a very long life and is, is honored in his old age when he returns to Charlottesville and, and reconnects with Ber Berkeley Bullock's son and others. So what did Berkeley Bullock do with his literacy? Uh, he attempted to run off. He, he attempted <laughs> to steal away. He, he did, at least once, run away, uh, perhaps with the aid of a forged pass, getting as far as the Ohio River. And how do we know this? We know this from a WPA narrative given by Horace Tonsler of Charlottesville. He shared the story with a, a WPA interviewer. And it's the story that Berkeley Bullock told to him. This is Horace Tonsler. Yes, I know the case of a runaway slave, Berkeley Bullock. And he has two sons living here now. One day we was driving up the road, and he showed me the very road he used when he first escaped. The road led to Bath County. He said he traveled at night by the moonshine. He said he would feel around the trees, and whichever side the moss grew on, he knew that was the north direction. Then he said he boarded a stage that went as far as the Ohio River. He aimed to get across. Um, and there's a kind of amusing anecdote about he, how he blacks up a white man who's sleeping, a drunk white man, and so the conductor puts him off the train. <laughs> and he didn't conclude all that. But it's, and it's all part of the Horace Tonsler story. But apparently Bullock did get captured, so he eluded capture, but, but he was still on the stage when it got the Ohio River, and they caught him there before he could make it across the river. But he may have been using the, 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 the ability to read right. He may, have, he may have forged his own pass, just as Peter Fawcett had intended. So what happens then? He's returned, uh, and presumably put back to work, and then I think this is always a crisis in the lives of the enslaved, right? When you are sold. That's what happened with Peter Fawcett. It happened to Berkeley Bullock as well. When Colonel Jones became embarrassed by financial troubles in the 1850s, he sold 36 valuable slaves to cover his debts. And bankruptcy records dated 1855 indicate that Bullock, Berk there's, there's, there's Berkeley, listed as Berkeley, if you can see that, Berkeley, S. Maupin, 1205. So we believe that he was sold to Socrates Maupin, a professor of chemistry at the University of Virginia. His mother, Cynthia, sold to William Brand for $5. She would have been elderly, sold to another. And apparently his brother, <coughs> is it on this page? I didn't include that, I'm sorry. I believe that there, uh, another source, Sam Calver, I, I believe, is Sam here today? No. I think Sam has suggested that his brother was also sold to another uh, buyer. So this is Socrates Maupin. He lived in Pavilion 8 on the lawn. That's a, a picture taken by University Communications today, and I found this on the uh, Special Collections website. This is kind of a mystery. Uh, so Socrates Maupin pa Maupin's papers are at the University of Virginia. And when you read the finding aid, it says, topics include plantation management, crops, the tobacco market, slave purchasing, hiring, and discipline, and, other, and, and land values, things that might have some bearing on our story, right? Especially slave purchasing, hiring, and discipline. And so, my son and I, this is Gideon, my son, first year in UVA. <laughs> he, uh, when I came up here this week and I said, I want to meet you at Special Collections. <laughs> and we pulled up the, uh, 
the Maupin papers. And what's curious about it is that this, this is the common <coughs> aid that we read there. There's no mention of slavery in this finding aid. So we didn't have, we couldn't go to letter X or Y or Z and find any reference to slavery or hiring or discipline. It may be in there, but I don't know why that the online index doesn't align with the printed index. There's another collection of papers with it that belongs to a man named Washington who writes to Maupin, but there's nothing in that index or finding aid that mentions slavery either. So this needs more work. Let me just say that, you know, it's. I think I will say one other thing, that the letters that are in this collection end in 1851 before Berkeley Bullet was purchased at bankruptcy sale. So they may not mention him by name, but I think it would be useful to get whatever we can find about Moffat and his relationship to slavery. If he says anything at all about slavery, about hiring, purchasing, discipline, that would be of some relevance in telling the story of Berkeley Bullet and his experience as an enslaved laborer at the university. Or, if not at the university, in the employ of Socrates Moffat, professor at the university. So, what that means is, we don't have a detailed account of Berkeley Bullock's life as an enslaved laborer in the employ of Socrates Moffat. That's going to have to await further documentation. But I won't give up on that, because I do think we'll find more. And of course, the university is very interested in this, obviously. This is part of an effort, a large effort to document the university's involvement with slavery. And I think this is an important part of that story. And putting a name, another name, on, you know, into public awareness. Berkeley Bullock is one of those enslaved people being honored by the university, being remembered. This is, I think, interesting as well. According to family history, Berkeley Bullock secured freedom for himself and his mother sometime before the Civil War. <coughs> this is from Franny, Fanny Bowles Leach's uh, unpublished, undated family history and memoir, which was shared with me by the family. Somehow he was freed first, and then bought his mother for a few dollars because she pretended to be feeble and not able to work for a so-called master. I love how she phrases that, too. And you can see the resistance all through this. That's, that's I think, really powerful thread running through the story is a story of resistance. <coughs> Again, unfortunately, that's all we know. Uh, maybe someone, I believe we have looked through the list of names of free persons of color in Charles, if I remember doing this some time ago, it would be useful to go back and see again. I'm sure I did that, but uh, I think for now we don't have documentation of his life as a free person before 1865. I think we take it on the family on, on, on what the family is telling us to be true and a really fascinating detail that he had freedom and and as historians we know that can give you an advantage after emancipation. To have been free before emancipation might have might be significant in understanding his success after emancipation. His ability to, to get very quickly become a, a property owner and very quickly mobilize um, as a free person. Okay, so this is where we get to part two. I know I went a little long into the first part of it, but I think it's important to know the backstory. So enslaved persons constituted more than half of the county's population in 1860. Uh, there were 14,000 enslaved persons uh, here in Albemarle County, and roughly 600 um, free persons of color. Um, and these communities of free persons existed before the war Emancipation transforms that. 14,000 people now resettling under very different circumstances, or trying to make them very different circumstances. And this is profit. The emancipation is dramatically going to transform these residential patterns. It's going to create new settlements, new neighborhoods, new communities of freedom. And of course, like many previously enslaved persons in post-emancipation Virginia and elsewhere, Bullock sees property ownership as the key to securing independence and economic autonomy for his family and his, himself. In September 1868, three months after the end of the Civil War, uh, three years, excuse me, and just months after the passage of the 14th Amendment, 
extending U.S. citizenship to African Americans, Berkeley Bullock purchases the first of many properties he would own during his lifetime. Bullock and his wife Mary bought a share in 243 acres of valuable real estate in rural Alamar County for $3,000 which was supposed to be paid back over three years. This is a farm that's located about eight, described as being about eight miles from Charlottesville and three miles from Earliesville. The Bullocks partnered on the purchase with another African-American couple, William and Caroline Brown, who used a house and lot that they owned in the city of Charlottesville to secure the $3,000 on the deed of trust. And so this is important too, right? Because what you see are African Americans uh, pooling their resources in a cash poor economy to purchase land for subsistence and investment. This is very early, 1868. There's not a lot of cash in Virginia available to make purchases, but they're able to get credit from white creditors. And so that's a question. How are they able to do that? I, I might, might one of my theories here is that they know these people. The, the white creditors are people they know and who know them and trust them, have some belief that they will, that they will, there will be a good return on this investment. However, when the third and final payment came due in 1871, the depressed condition of the country and financial difficulties in the state, county and state, left them unable to pay the whole of the debt secured. And I'm taking that language from William Brown's statement. This is conditions beyond their control. The whole lot, house and lot, and 243 acres are put up for sale, advertised for sale at auction. William Brown petitioned the Chancery Court to delay a public sale, saying <coughs> the farm would yield sufficient profits to pay off the notes by spring. And I can't tell you whether the sale was delayed or not. I just know that eventually it was sold. But the Chancery Court records are valuable to say they fought to hold on to this land. Um, that in some ways, the, that's an interesting point, right? Whether or not you could persuade people uh, that you that, that just wait a little bit longer. But they were up against a lot. And some of it was just environmental conditions and economic conditions beyond their control, right? Um, what's interesting to me is that Brown and his family ended up leaving uh, the Charlottesville area, and I found them in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 1880 census. I was very interested in Brown and his family as well. And I said, well, you know, that's Cambridge. Cambridge. They're actually, uh, we have other con connections to Cambridge in Charlottesville, African Americans who moved to Cambridge Port, which was an African American neighborhood in Cambridge, Mass. Um, so there may have been a small community of people up there who knew each other from Virginia. But that's where the, the Browns ended up. And that's a strategy. They left. They did not choose to stay. But Bullock and his wife decided to cast their bucket down where they were. They did not leave. And I think that, again, this is about choices that you make. And he, and he felt his best chance was to try again here. And so in December 1871, just one month after he advertised the sale of the first property, Berkeley Bullock purchases a 35-acre Alamar County lot from John Shackleford, a 74-year-old white farmer, for $435. It took about 13 years to consummate this sale. I have the footnote there. Um, and uh, Bullock has to basically petition and say, Shackleford has departed the lot this life. Um, this is property I've long since paid in full, and the family agreed to that. So, so eventually you do have some documentation that he did fully purchase this land, did not lose this land. And um, so at this point, it's 35 acres. It's gonna, we're going to see it get bigger, but let's keep that in mind for now. So this is the 1870 census. Berkeley Bullock relies on a large and extended family to work the land. Um, and here we're turning to the 1870 census. It shows that he and his wife Mary have eight children, ranging from age 17 to age one. And that's not uncommon to have large families working farms. Um, so presumably he relied on his family, uh, his children, and maybe some uh, other brother and other relatives to help. His mother, Cynthia Bullock, listed as 70, but possibly older, lived nearby, as did his brother John and his five children. So there's a community. The Bullock family settles in this area, and they are, this is their home. Now we go to the 1880 U.S. Census, and you see the changing face of the Bullock household. Four grown children have struck out on their own, 
and there are four new children, four young children born into the family. Um, and what I found interesting was that three were listed as Alice, Berkeley Jr., and Albert who were living at home and attending school. So Ber this is evidence, again, that Berkeley Bullock um, believed in education for his children, sent his children to school. And we're going to see this, that they do go on, and some become teachers as, as well. Um, but it's interesting to sort of see that you can actually, you can document this, that, that he's sending his children to school. <coughs> By 1880, Bullock owned 75 acres in this area. And um, he's listed as the sole, this is from the agricultural census, which is a, an appendix to the, to what we usually use our population census, but here we're also drawing on another source. And it says that he owns 20 acres of improved land and 50 acres of unimproved land. It's a little technical here, but you know, it might be interesting to see. What does he have? He's got $1,200 in farm uh, and land, fences and buildings. He's got livestock worth $30. One milk cow, one calf, one <coughs> swine, and 14 poultry. They get right down to the nitty gritty. Now, I can tell you exactly how many poultry he's got. How many chickens? Um, and this, I think, shows you the kind of small scale farming activities that are taking place here on this land. On the Yelp, on, on the, the uh, property that we now understand to be part of the Ivy Creek Natural Area along the Yellow Trail. So when I'm talking about this, this is we're on the site. If not right on it, we're very close to it. So here, here here's the breakdown. Berkeley Bullock employs no wage laborers. He relies on himself, his wife, and his extended family to work the farm. He plants Indian corn, produces 25 bushels, a quarter acre of Irish potatoes, one sixteenth of an acre of sweet potatoes. Let's see how much he yields from each of those. He has an orchard of 50 apple trees, good for 100 bushels, a half acre of peach trees, and all the orchard products together, sold or consumed, come to $25. <laughs> he grew grapes, sold 200 pounds of grapes, but made no wine, according to the census. <laughs> he, was, he had honey, he had bees. He was 15 pounds of honey. But according to the census, no wax. I don't get that. But, uh, and also 20 cores of wood sold or consumed $40 worth of forest products. So this is the kind of detail that you could weave into an interpretation of this site, right? What, what kind of small-scale farming activities? How did you make money? You can think of it as subsistence, but also some of these products being made, being grown and produced for sale. Total value of all farm production, $100. I don't know what $100 was at the time, but I don't think he's getting rich. Yes? Why would somebody tell a census taker the truth? Ah, <laughs> It's a I agree with you, but... I think that's a great point. I think all of our sources, well, we, should, I we should question... I, I agree, and I, I thank you for remembering from calling it to question whether or not what we see is exactly what was happening. Let's say this is what Berkeley Bullock reported. Put it that way. Some of it probably was visible to the census taker's eye. You have to report something, and it probably seemed reasonable. So here we are. This is a, the beautiful, one of the beautiful maps done by Steve Bullock. Uh, Steve uh, Thompson's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's Berkeley Bullock's property. Here's Hugh Carr right here, and Hugh Carr right here. This is Berkeley Bullock's property. And so for 50, at least 15 years, Bullock and his extended family of 13 children and relatives make this place their, their home. Uh, this is their community, their neighbor, Hugh Carr, uh, whose memory we celebrate and on whose property we sit, is right there next door. And this is uh, just another shot of that same map. There's Berkeley Bullock. And this is, you can sort of see the same outline of the, uh, the river. I don't know if it's lining up. It's, oh, there's the, is that right? No. Here's the yellow trail here. Well, we'll work on that. I, I, <laughs> all I know is the yellow trail. I, I, oh, we have another map. Wait, I think it shows it better. No, that's that. All, this is a nice map of the 35-acre property of 1871 next to Hugh Carr of 1870. So that gives you a nice picture. We we like to now figure out where the other uh, 40 acres are. You can see the gas lines got to the back, so you could walk that 
podcast. Ah, okay, great. Okay, so uh, here's Wild here. He's not simply farming. He's also forming a community. He's contributing to the the uh, organization of the old what was called the Old Ivy Creek Baptist Church. Now, now meaning 1908, called the Union Ridge Baptist Church. Um, oops. Uh, what happened there? Whoa. Where's the rest of my slides? There we go. Okay, I don't know what happened there. Sorry, folks. Uh, but he's 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 made a, a he he has a stake in the land. He he's got his he's been there for 15 years. This is a this is a turning point. He's 55 years old. What are his options? You know, is he going to continue farming this plot of land, or is he going to move from the countryside to the city, and or is he going to join those heading north and west in search of better opportunity? And so the question is, how can he best care for himself, his family, and his people? And um, the answer is that he, like many other African Americans of this era, decided to move. Um, and of course, this is a time of great mobility among African Americans. This is at my, my mentor, Ed Ayers' book, The Promise of the New South. Tens of thousands of black southerners are moving around from the countryside to the towns and cities of the New South. And that's what Berkeley Bullock does. And there's all kinds of great primary source evidence of this. This is Laura Langhorn and the Southern Workmen. Nothing about the colored people today impresses, this is 1886, impresses the observer more than the way they travel about. Every train carries away from the South colored people. They go by the hundreds, and many of them return no more. But Berkeley Bullock said, I want to stay here. I think my best shot is here. Probably because he knew people. He had a lot of connections here. He could build on all of that. He chose this, he knew this, the racial boundaries. He knew this landscape. He knew the social landscape. He knew the economic landscape. And he could capitalize on these family and community ties, these patron-client relationships, linking former slaves and former masters. So sometime, I don't know what happened to my picture there. Sorry, folks. Uh, he establishes himself sometime in the 1880s as a pioneer businessman. Um, this is from the 1889-89 Charlottesville City Directory. They list him as the proprietor of a restaurant opposite the Virginia Midland Junction. So, and as I mentioned, he had competition there. Wright's Railroad Dining Room was across the way, owned by a white man, staffed by African-American cooks and waiters, and that was his worry. Remember he said he was worried about that, new, that our newfangled restaurant? That's Wright's, uh, Wright's restaurant. He also, uh, according to the students, uh, that restaurant that he had catered to students and uh, often riotous customers. Uh, this is a great description. From under his bushy eyebrows there gleam with unabated brilliancy a pair of furtive, restless eyes which seem always on the alert for chance, gain, or unexpected disaster at the hands of his, alas, too often riotous customers. So this was, he was, these are white students in his restaurant. How do you control them? How do you, how do you, how do you assert yourself as an African-American businessman at this time? And of course, they, they talk about him almost being resigned, you know? He's noiselessly gliding about. He stands in the corner. You can just imagine him eyeing his customers with folded hands and a look of resigned despair. What am I going to do? He's never certain of his pay. He's always haunted with a gnawing fear that the frolics and students may even make away with his house. Now, that's humorous, but it's also real. That anxiety is real. These are, these are real concerns. Uh, when they say uh, they'll pay him later, he says, he's, they say, this is the students, he's a kind-hearted man, and when asked for credit after the meal has been consumed, he acquiesces with a fair show of grace. But what, what else could he do? What else could he do but acquiesce? Um, this is how he survived. He knew how to survive. Um, but it was a very tenuous and perilous life, I think. And I think that you have to imagine the kind of self-aware, like how he had to carry himself through life every day, aware of not, not uh, appearing to be threatening to the white people he interacted with, the students, the, the, uh, the fellow business people. But apart from his relationship with the white customers, it's also his family. This was a family business. His daughter, Ella, worked at the restaurant, and uh, so did his two sons. Um, they learned, the sons learned to cater food and wait the tables, and later they waited on the railroad dining cars. His friends and family talked about him as a great cook. Uh, Fanny Bowles, Leach wrote, How I remember his homemade ice cream and the best vegetable soup I ever had. 
So there's a family life that takes place quite apart from his relationship with the white people and the customers. He has a family life, and we're so blessed to have these sources that tell us about that. Right? It's not only the student point of view, but his family tells us they loved him, they, and they have very rich memories of him and his cooking. We also have newspaper articles that tell us that he was an ice cream vendor. He would, he would go to the military exercises at the Albemarle County Court Fairgrounds. The crowd cleaned up the ice cream and chicken that was sale, for sale by Mr. Bullock. <laughs> he was a steward at the summer resorts. We know a lot about that. I've, I've been reading a lot on preserver sites about, and other, uh, about the history of the of African Americans who worked at the resorts. He was one of them. He happened to be away from home in the mountains when, when Peter Fawcett came back to town, which is really unfortunate. Uh, the men who taught him to read and write came back here, but he was working in the mountains at the time. He was a real estate investor and broker, and, and this is really easily documented, incredibly um, important part of the story. Um, he's able to secure a number of properties, which in some times he did this for others, for relatives, and uh, we, I can document many cases of, of, the, of the property that he built, bought for himself or sold to others. These are just a few examples, Will's old ice pond. This is near Vinegar Hill, or in Vinegar Hill. Um, here's one he bought, he built a house on the lot and sold it to William Wills at the price of 400 Lot number 15, he purchased this property at public auction for $78. This is before the imposition of uh, Jim Crow residential segregation. It's before we see the widespread practice of uh, covenants, as Jordy Yeager was talking about the other day at the Cultural Landscapes Workshop. Um, you could go to a public auction and buy property without being denied on the basis of race. And many African Americans in this period take advantage of that. They buy a lot of property in public auction. Um, here's one who took this property off the hands of Oberdorfer who purchased it at a public auction and then sold it. So he's flipping these properties, um, selling them, not always for necessarily a big profit, but I think he's sort of an intermediary for African Americans he knew. He knew how to do this. And I, I see this as the precursor to, um, to what he's going to do on a larger scale with the Piedmont group. And I do have some examples of him doing this for friends and family. I won't go into detail because I want to get to this. His success as a financier for friends and family, I think, may have led him and other, working with others to conceive of a more broadly collaborative venture to promote property ownership among African Americans here in central Virginia. In April of 1889, remember he hadn't been there very long, April 89, hadn't been in Charlottesville very long. He joins with eight other African American businessmen from Charlottesville to form the Piedmont Industrial and Land Improvement Company, a joint stock company chartered by the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is remarkable. And this is a, a, a handwritten uh, uh, facsimile of the um, facsimile of the handwritten charter. It's one of the first charters in the Charlottesville Charter Book. Among the objects of the Piedmont Company, to purchase, hold, lease, rent, improve, sell, exchange, develop, and otherwise deal in real estate, to buy and sell real estate on commission, and to extend aid and assistance, financial and otherwise, to persons of limited means in purchasing homes. 1889, a chartered company, African Americans, the company was authorized by state law to issue up to 100,000 in total stock with individual shares selling for $50 each. An investor could purchase one share in the company for $50, paid in monthly installments of $1. So it's affordable. It's affordable. Put, put aside a dollar a week. If you take one share in the company and the sales pitch goes, at the end of 50 months, you'll have $50, and all the $50 have accumulated. And this gets a lot of coverage in the Richmond Planet. And, um, they talk about in the first month of operation, the company purchased 10 lots and 15 to 20 lots bordering on the new city. That may not, you know, I mean, maybe in the grand scheme of things, may not be equivalent to what the Charlottesville Land Company is doing, but it's of, of great importance to understand that African Americans are engaged in this and are trying to get their piece of this and, and to do it communally. Thus you see, Charlottesville is blooming, and with it blooms the only land improvement company organized by colored men, chartered by law, and in successful operation in Piedmont, Virginia. This company is a blessing to us, and will produce rich results with such untiring, honest, and earnest officers. And then it lists the officers. I just wanted to show the Berkeley Bullet in there. 
But you'll know some of the other names. I'm sure for those of you who do local research or involved with the preservers will recognize Robert Pelser, Charles Cole, Benjamin Tonsler, D.D. Alexander. These were the leading men of, uh, of, the, of the day uh, behind this enterprise. And it's, for me, I, there's a long history, it's much more than the history of this, but I love this uh, as a kind of image, the county fair the, the organized by the Piedmont Company. They did more than simply sell land. They held uh, a county fair and really were celebrating <coughs> the success of, the pe of their people, really saying, we are we are building something here, we're coming, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to acknowledge this and hold the county fair and, 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 um, and do this quite openly. Um, so this is touted as the first countywide fair ever sponsored in this area or in Virginia by African Americans. Pedestrians by the hundreds and a variety of vehicles indescribable made their way to the fairgrounds. The president and directors of the Land Improvement Company, including Berkeley Bullock, arrive on horseback. So I have this great image of this moment where Berkeley Bullock and the directors are riding into the fairground. There's a, a great detail account of the, of the fair. This is the account by J. Francis Robinson, who was the correspondent for the uh, planet. The fair, and, and one of the prime movers in the fair and in the uh, group. The fair was a grand success financially and numerically. It was a great credit to Charlottesville, a great boom for the Piedmont Industrial and Land Company, and proof positive that the Afro-American is here to stay and share in the benefits accruing from a land of plenty and abundant prosperity. There's a lot of hope and, and optimism in this. These, these are people who are working hard, they're entrepreneurial, and they really believe that they can make they can make it. That if they work hard, and these are people working three or four different jobs. If you look at Berkeley Bullock, ice dealer, vendor, restaurant owner, steward at the resorts, five, <coughs> six jobs going, seasonal, they're working hard, but they really have this amazing faith. They really do believe that they that they can rise, that their people are here to stay, and they're making their mark. What, what year was it there? 18, uh, I believe it was 1891. 91 was the fair, so it starts in 89. Okay, so the epilogue here, I, I just want to say that, you know, talk a little bit about um, how the students saw what they wanted to see in Berkeley Bullock, right? They wanted to see an illiterate ex-slave well-schooled in domestic service and in the etiquette of racial relations in the Jim Crow South. He knew his place, right? That's what they say. He well knows his place. Really, I think what they were seeing, too, was his ability to sort of, to, to, to navigate this perilous terrain, uh, to hold back, to not, not say anything that would reveal, in some ways, all that he knew and all that he was doing to, to challenge that system. Um, that, that was keeping people down. He was working every angle to bring his people up, but he did it in a way that did not uh, that did not alert the students to this incredible backstory. The students certainly few of them were aware of these intricate financial dealings that, that allowed them to acquire more than a dozen properties, open a restaurant, establish a wood, coal, and ice business, and they couldn't guess that he was also providing for the education of his children. And as I mentioned, several went on to become teachers and civic leaders. And I, I think what's interesting too is that his influence goes beyond this increasingly segregated world of black neighborhoods and black businesses. He's helping to transform Charlottesville itself from a sleepy railroad depot into a thriving New South commercial entrepot. He is a pioneer businessman of Charlottesville, not a pioneer, not simply a black businessman, and he's recognized as such by the Daily Progress. And, and I, I think, uh, you know, well, when, when I get to his uh, obituary here, uh, you'll see they, they, they and this, this too is in its own way, you know, has deep racist condescending dimensions to it in the sense that Berkeley Bullock is seen as a worthy colored man, right? So it's, it's really a slur on the massive colored people who are deemed unworthy. And yet at the same time, I don't want to take anything away from the fact that they recognized what he had accomplished, that it was so significant in their eyes that, that it bared repeating what he had accomplished. He, and, and in their obituary, in their, there's not only a, a death notice, but the funeral notice, it mentions his organization of the old Ivy Creek Baptist Church, 
uh, now the Union Ridge Baptist Church, and it says he was one of the pioneer businessmen of the city. And to me, that that, that in some ways is uh, an honest <coughs> thing to say that, to not simply say he was an, uh, one of the pioneer colored businessmen, but that he was active and, and important in the history of the city as a whole. And of course, what a great legacy uh, his descendants, uh, who I've come to know over the research, time of the research here. This is Cheryl, who's with us, Cheryl Pulling. Hannah, who has become the heir to Jean Henderson as the family history keeper. And flew here, came here from New Jersey for this talk. We, we talk a lot via Facebook and email and share a lot. But here she is with her daughter. Daughter. Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah. And what school the is The Charles this? H. Bulldog School. And Charles is Charles is the son of Berkeley Bull, and Charles is the one who, who gave his memoirs and talked about uh, his father being educated by Peter Fawcett. There's a deep, long memory through the family history, oral tradition, written records, and I just thought this was such a beautiful photo, um, and, and a really important part of the story. Berkeley Bullock is honored within the family. I think Cheryl can certainly attest to that, but not the only Bullock honored by the family. Uh, Charles is a, a huge figure in family and community history. Oh, Cheryl, do you want to tell us anything about Charles? Um, sure. <laughs> um, Charles H. Bullock was um, a son of Berkeley's, and he was raised in Charlottesville, and he wanted more. And he studied the YMCA color program out of England. And he beat out 200, after being a school teacher at the Jefferson Normal School, he beat out 240 something other candidates to become the secretary of the YMCA in Brooklyn, New York in 1905. So he came from Charlottesville and went to Brooklyn to open up a YMCA. And he did so well there that they sent him to Louisville, Kentucky. And then after being in Louisville, Kentucky, they sent him to Montclair, New Jersey. And in Montclair is when he finally brought his family together to, 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 for them to live because they didn't really follow him into Brooklyn. They stayed in Charlottesville with um, their grandparents and his, his wife. But when they finally moved to Montclair, the whole family moved. And the YMCA there, you know, it's impressive because there were 40 dorm rooms. And he took a personal responsibility for these people's lives. He wasn't just providing them somewhere to stay. He made a difference in them. And so when the YMCA was torn down, um, his name was put in the hat to name the school after him. And they named the school the Charles H. Bullock School. Thank you. Right that way. And so uh, lived so close 
in such close proximity to um, Hugh Carr and his family. Do you did you come across any references to his relationship with the next door neighbors? You know, I don't have family papers. I don't. I mean, I have family histories, but I don't have letters. The only way to document that is if their names appear together in newspapers or um, in deeds. And so I'm sure they knew each other. And I, I have to think that they socialized and that their families intermingled. And you know, there were all kinds of connections there. But they're just not something easily documented. Maybe more easily documented through the car records. I don't know how the, the car papers would shed light on that relationship. What do you know about the car? Is there Ken Jefferson? The question is about the cars, the car family. Are they Ken and Jefferson? We don't know, but we haven't we have found that, that connection. There was a connection between the Simmons family. Yes. It doesn't matter. So they did marry their neighbors. Were they white or African American? The cars? The Q car? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right here. Right here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, right here, and then I'll come yes. can, can you talk a bit more about how he financed all these transactions and, and how the African American community in general did at that time? I mean, was, was it all done by credit or did, were, cash they, were credit. they cash in? A Com combination of cash and credit. I, I, I think I have a slide here that says that. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, all the sales were partly for cash and partly on credit. I think that he's, you know, selling and taking cash and then reinvesting it, you know, constantly sort of. Once he had cash, uh, acquired enough cash to do this. Now, the restaurant may have been generating a certain amount of cash, but you look at, uh, you know, who are the creditors is the question, right? But, but the initial thing was the $3,000, which is a huge amount of money. Right. So how did he finance that? Well, uh, there was... Uh, they put the house up, the Charlottesville house. Uh, William Brown and Caroline Brown put their house up. And um, it, we, we have the names of white creditors. And I, I've done some research into the creditors. The, the, credit, the, the creditors, the white people who called in the loan, because I was fascinated by that question. I'm not sure I can't really get into it today, but um, I'm trying to understand the degree to which they may have or may not have given them any latitude. And why that might have been. Like why not extend? Why not give them six months, right? How, how strict were they on these? You know, was it simply a business deal or was there something where you could sort of call in a friendship or a favor? And, you know, Jones, I think, dies in 68. I don't know, do you remember? Uh, I, think he, I think he died, I think, not long after the Civil War. So he not, he's not just. My question was can you call in a former master? Can, you know, can, can Socrates Maupin uh, be called in as somebody who will vouch for you, and, and particularly on a financial dealing? I think that's important to all this, is to understand the nature of these creditor-debtor relations. I will say, I think that those relationships inhibit <coughs> political activity. Uh, and Brown was a cooperationist, I know that. He, uh, politically, uh, getting along with the former uh, masters and, you know, trying to find a way to have peace politically. He was not on the radical side. Berkeley Bullock was a Republican. The students tell us that. He's because it's the party that set, set us free. But he's not active. And I think that when you're in debt, when you're, you know, these creditor-debtor relationships really do inhibit political activity on the part of, of, of those who are, the African Americans who are involved. In They're conservative white men who are lending the money. And you have to be careful, I think, and, and that partly, I think, explains his strategy was to kind of keep a low profile. This is my impression of Berkeley Book. You keep a low profile, right? Being politically active would not have been in his, to his advantage. Yes? Oh, question? Is there any documentation that talks about his reasons for the history of founding the church in the Andes or founding the Andes? Well, they don't, they don't really talk about it as being leaving. It's interesting. It's almost like he, he's both. Uh, he, I, the, the only documentation I have is the, um, let me go back to the obituary. Can you repeat the question? The question was, is there evidence of his reason for Just any information as to the church, the history of the church, why he's regarding the Irish right. church? 
And how did it go from Adder Creek to Union Ridge? Well, I, I have a question about that as well, because I was looking at a map the other day. It's, it's either the 1907 or the 1920 map shows both an Ivy Creek Church and a Union Ridge Church. And they said they combined. Mm -hmm. They combined. Churches just combined. Scott? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the original Ivy Creek Church was a white church on the old Barracks Road, which okay. is Lands Road, that continues on. Oh. Um, the white church, right after the war, sold the property, or, or they left. They left. And they, they, they moved to the site they're still on, on the Woodlands Road. Oh, okay. The foundations of that church, I've been there with Dee Dee and with Edwina and with Jane, they're out in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that spot almost certainly was the original I was, was the original Union Ridge slash Ivy Creek Church, and it was probably also where the um, the school was originally started. Mm -hmm. right. It was the first church site in an old church building, and then the church got its got enough funds to buy the piece of property that the church and build the church on the property where it still stands today. Um, well, I mean, if people out in the country, I would venture to say that'd be a reason to have start a church because who wants right. to go all the way back into the city just to attend services? Now, if I move out in the country, I need a church. And if I want one, I might just go. So here's all I know about his church going and his role in both churches. This is from the obituary. He he had been a member of the Ebenezer Baptist Church for 60 years, so he would have joined Ebenezer, according to this, at age 17. Does that make sense? I think it says it's
I think I would like to raise the possibility too that his family, some of his family, stay here on the property. I think Steve, you might be able to talk to speak to this that the the the, 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 the what happened to the what became of the bullet property here. It didn't immediately. There's no. I don't have evidence that he sold it when he moved to the city. So it, there's a good chance his family remained here, or had some, or some of his family members remained here. I, I, I only know the deed by which he purchased it, and, I don't, and then the later history of the property. Right. There was a man named um, William Washington who ended up with it by, I want to say, the very early 20th century. But but, but he didn't buy it from Berkeley Bullets. So there, there's somebody in between, and the Washingtons lived on the property for a number of years. And, and then Colin Greer bought a portion of it, and the Washingtons sold it. Um, and then other people, eventually a lot of it came into the Ivy Creek property back in the early 70s. But I, what's interesting here for me is that your interest in this as part of the interpretation of this site I think will generate more research. Mm -hmm. the, these are issues I left behind. I just followed Berkeley Bull up to Charlottesville and said, buy a town or county. I didn't really care at that point much about what happened to the property. But it raises the question if the family had a foothold here and you know maybe he was able to sort of keep the farm at some level, or maybe they supplied the food that he sold at his restaurant. Maybe there's a connection there. I don't know. And I'm not sure we can answer all these questions. Right. That's one of the other things. And, you know, I'm kind of surprised how much we did find. At some level, you know, try doing this with you all, a lot of you do genealogy and you realize how little there is. I'm just amazed at the wealth of information that we've been able to find on Berkeley. Well, the land ownership can be traced quite thoroughly through the land tax books. If anybody takes the time to grind through that stuff, because it'll be a grind. That sounds like a Bob Murray job. Oh, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've done your, you've done your work. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, I'm pretty sure that when the history files still existed before they were burned, um, right. that we did, I did photograph the, uh, all the parcels out in this area, and there may be something in there that documents exactly where you should go for these records. Well, I think the Ivy Creek Foundation uh, could, could you know, continue to support the research and fill out that part of the story. I think it's exciting to see the mapping that you've done, uh, Steve, and, and, and you know, bringing, being, bringing this, more, making this more visible, because there, there clearly is a pattern of African American land ownership throughout this area. I can see that, obviously, in what you've mapped, but I know it goes beyond that. Well, there, there's a, yeah, there's yeah. A, community, a series of, of connected communities. And to be able to wrap all of that would be... Cartersville and Georgetown, and, I mean, it's yeah. reached all the way back to Charlottesville. Right. And each one of these, though, research each one of these takes a lot of work, a lot of time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that all we all do this, but I have to say, that's why, you know, sometimes we come up with these ambitious plans and you realize how much effort went into just one person's story or one piece of property to build out the story around that. It's a, it's a big undertaking and it wouldn't happen without someone caring, right? You wouldn't bother. Sometimes we do this because we have a kind of obsession with it. But I think that the reason it matters here is partly the Bullock family, that they care and they've kept this alive and they wanted this story to be told and, and commemorated. And also the community, the African American community here, the preservers, and the bullet plot at preservers, Daughters of Zion Cemetery. The, the, the bullet plot there is another reason we want the story told. And now we have another partner in this, which is Ivy Creek Foundation, which cares because they actually own the property that Berkeley Bullock and his family farmed. Yes? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Do you know how long? Um, or if his family continued the business after he died and held on to the properties he had bought, or did they leave quickly? Well, I didn't follow that out. I think we could probably, again, I, this was kind of a side project, just to be honest with you. It's not the central part. I, I, it's sometimes amazing to me you know, how much I've been able to do this along the way. But it's a great question. You know, it's, it's sort of like, and then it's, you know, one more step of research, we could probably answer that. And that is probably part of the story of this migration out of Charlottesville, that the Bullock family has largely left, right? I mean, yeah, this is the story you were telling us. And the same with the West. The West left. And, um, you know, Bullock stayed, Berkeley Bullock stayed, but then later, the after, just particularly in the era of Jim Crow, 
And when it didn't matter whether you knew somebody, whether you could call in the reputation of Colonel Jones or Socrates Mobbin, it didn't matter anymore. Jim Crow said, if you're black, get back, right? The law says you can't live here. It didn't matter. So those, those children of Berkeley Bullock and John West didn't enjoy the same latitude of calling on relationships. I, you know, a white man could say, he's OK. That, and that made a difference. But in the era of Jim Crow, that didn't make a difference. You couldn't, the law said. And so that next generation, they left. They left. They stayed for a while, but then it came to a point where they just had much better chance, much better opportunity elsewhere, particularly up in North. And in this case, Montclair, New Jersey. Up. What became of the Piedmont Land Company? I, I, don't, I don't know if you all are trying to map that. I think I've heard it before. Several people have tried to map all the problems. It was dissolved by 1892, I think, but they had bought enough property, and there's an article in the Daily Progress, no, Richmond Times, that lists a number of the properties along yes. Dye Street. I've so there is a way that. in which you, we try to articulate, and we'll try, we'll try to articulate exactly right. where those properties were. But it's all, it's mostly, you know, if you go back behind First Baptist and you start to look at that neighborhood, right. that's largely where that property is. And some of it Rose. over Rose Hill properties, nice. they're buying properties right next to the Charlottesville in, Improvement Land Company. Mm -hmm. I remember, I asked Mother McGinnis about this. She remembered Piedmont, um, a Piedmont uh, company. Is a location. Like a, a location. Like she, she remembered it. I think it had its moment, but then they reported in the, the planet, we're done, we're doing our last sale, and, and that was it. So they, you know, what became of the properties, they were just simply purchased by uh, the stakeholders or whoever. And the shareholders benefited, right? Their, their money generated wealth. So there's. the town, like my grandfather, great grandfather, lived on this street, one of they, they stay. They stay, right? So maybe that's part of the legacy too. Was that to get a foothold here? The people who were able to acquire property were more likely to stay. Um, that's an interesting. That's really interesting, right? Okay, so that's. I think that's partly the strategy here. Is property is going to root you. You're going to have a much better chance of success. And look, that's the tragedy. Of, that's the tragedy of Vinegar Hill, right? Those, when you look at those deeds, the people who were forced to sell under eminent domain, and some of them having held that property for generations, and and not finding it unbelievable that they could be forced to sell this, and and you know against their will, having held on through 1965 against all odds, and then they be just told, "This is how much we're going to give you, and now you have to move." Good luck. So there's a long term.